Good afternoon and welcome to today's ACPE Academy webinar. My name is Mark Medwed and I'm the program manager at the ACPE. Today's webinar is the third in our series and will focus on pastoral care and advocacy beyond the hospital walls. The topic is presented today by Bill Caventa, the director of the Summer Institute on Theology and Disability and Collaborative on Faith and Disability, and Maggie Cobb, staff chaplain at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available for playback from the ACP Academy webpage. We'll also be posting the slides from today's presentation. At the conclusion of the webinar, you'll have the opportunity to post questions for the presenters. When you move your mouse on the screen, you'll see a Q&A button. Click on the button and type your question. Due to the potentially high number of questions that will be asked, please know that not all questions may be answered as part of the webinar. It is now my pleasure to introduce our presenters today, Bill and Meggie. Hi everyone, thank you so much, Mark. Um, and thank you all of you for joining us uh, for the third part of our webinar series um, about ministry with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, it's really exciting to be uh, involved in presenting on a topic that we know that we're passionate about, um, but that there seems to be a great uh, interest in as well. Um, as Mark said, I'm the staff chaplain here at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, we are uh, in a major urban area. We do uh, a little bit of everything here, and my expertise within the hospital uh, is emergency medicine. So I've got the emergency department, I've got uh, the observation unit, and I've got psych emergency. Um, and in all three of those places, as well as throughout the rest of the hospital, uh, we encounter lots of patients with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, so it's really gratifying to be able to help people build on the information that they have because chances are you know people in your community for whom that, that's, that applies. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit today about um, what happens when those patients are out in the community. How do we engage with them in these, these different areas? So um, as far as why we're doing this series, uh, Bill and I actually began working together um, a few months back, um, sort of picking each other's brains about, you know, how do we talk about this in this context? Um, and we've been working together on uh, a decision-making uh, group that uh, deals with end-of-life issues um, for people with developmental disabilities. Um, we're working on that with Trace Haythorn, uh, who represents the ACPE. Um, and I know that it's a, a personal issue for both of us, something that we're both excited about, something that we're both passionate about. Um, in addition to being a chaplain here at the hospital where I encounter people with disabilities, uh, I'm also mom to one neurotypical child and one child with special needs. Uh, my son Ian is 10 and he is extraordinary and happy and into Legos and also happens to have autism. So for me, it's, it's not just a professional interest. It's something that's deeply personal as well. And Bill, there you go. What is normal? Uh, this is one of my favorite things that I like to share all of the time. Uh, it's sort of a 1950s housewife sitting there knitting, and the little girl says, Mom, what is normal? And her reply is, well, it's just a setting on the dryer, honey. I think that normal is something that uh, carries a lot of uh, emotional weight, a lot of connotation to it. Uh, so instead of normal, you'll hear us using words like neurotypical, or we'll talk about IDDs, intellectual and developmental disabilities, uh, just as a way of, of taking the value uh, statement away from normal. Um, normal implies that there's abnormal, and so we're going to be talking about the range of experiences with developmental and intellectual disabilities. We're also going to be looking at things uh, over the course of a person's life. Um, we've talked in the first two webinars a little bit about what is it like to be engaged in pastoral care with someone with an IDD, um, as well as what grief can look like in different ways throughout a person's life. Um, and that can be anything from being supportive for a family or a patient at the time of diagnosis, which for a lot of folks it happens very early, either at birth or during their toddler years. Um, opportunities for inclusion. Well, what does it mean to raise a child or to be a young child um, who has these very clear differences but still wants and deserves to be integrated into the rest of, of their group and their community? Um, we encounter people with IDDs during major rites of passage uh, as people of faith, regardless of our denomination. So that could be baptisms, confirmations, um, the major life, uh, life touch points uh, through the, the life of a congregation. 
as well as transitions. Um, if people are entitled when they have a disability to receive a certain amount of services until the age of 21. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But what happens at 21 is that all of these entitled services suddenly fall off. And there, there's a transition into adulthood. What does that mean? How do their services change? How do their lives change? Um, we'll talk about the transition from school to work. We'll talk about uh, adult services, um, how people continue to be involved in uh, ways that are more uh, adult in nature with their faith communities. Um, and we spent uh, the second webinar talking about grief and loss uh, throughout their life and at the time of their death. So what I do what we want to do here is start <clears throat> Assuming you're in the hospital or pastoral care, you've gotten introduced to somebody maybe through your pastoral care in a hospital setting, and some of the and maybe through exactly some of those issues of grief or loss or trauma that we we talked about last time. Some of the core pastoral roles that have been key for me over the years have been one this sense of presence and just being there. This is not new to any of you. Uh, with the willingness to ask about the story and tell, have people tell you their story so you know who they are beyond the labels, uh, to guide people as they search for meaning or search for direction and sense of hope within hospital settings or within their, within their own lives. Advocacy has been a third part of that pastoral role for me for years. And the image I always use is, is not the the picture of like Jesus holding the sheep in his arms, but of the shepherd or shepherdess with a rod and staff, uh, fending off danger, cutting through red tape, finding green pastures and waters, uh, leading through the valleys of the shadow of death. Uh, you know, those that kind of image of a very active shepherding advocacy in relationship to the environment. And then the fourth major role of helping people find and build a community of support, that pastoral care is not just about relationships one-to-one, -one, but also in, in communities, in congregations, uh, in the communities that we part of. Now, assuming you've gotten in contact with somebody around a grief or loss issue, many agencies who support people and families really struggle with that. So that right away becomes an opportunity for pastoral and community outreach as you meet people in the hospital. What have you found out uh, through your visits, uh, through the pastoral visits in the hospital, uh, through your assessments, through talking with caregivers, including maybe agency staff who were assigned to come and sit with somebody or be present with somebody in the hospital through their friends? Or what have you found out through people who attend your congregation and what do you know about them? Uh, kind of it first starts obviously with relationships and what you know about people and what you discover more about their ongoing lives and then so to follow up if someone died in your hospital setting what happens when those caregivers go home wherever that home is uh, an agency residence a group home a family residence Maybe somebody lives in a supported apartment building with a number of other people with disabilities who have their own apartments. Um, do those people, agencies, friends, do they have sources to help with funerals? So many people are not connected to congregations that I've, I've, I've been called in sometimes to do funerals. What you don't want to happen for my perspective is that an agency just gets forced to kind of rent a clergyman, so to speak, for a, for a funeral. You'd like to have somebody, and if you're in that position, try to get to know something about that person before that funeral happens. Um, who needs to be told and informed? Uh, an agency may really struggle with how they're going to tell other people who they support about the loss or the death of this friend. Uh, of theirs, of other people, and having someone to go with them, to be with them, to use your capacity, your gifts and skills, and explaining or talking, sharing news with somebody, with other people, could be a real asset to them and, and a way to build, begin to build the relationship. 
Those contacts then can lead to opportunities for pastoral support or other supports and and maybe then even how an agency fault deals with grief and loss as a whole. And most provider agencies are just beginning to think about their agency policies, how they can be proactive and helping <clears throat> train staff and others to be to know what to do uh, when those situations happen. Um, perhaps helping an agency to build relationships with local resources like hospice care organizations, clergy of different faith groups. Some agencies have a grief response team that clergy have been connected to so that there are people they know who they can call on uh, and who are known, hopefully, by their staff and some of the people there, not just a stranger who has to send in as a grief counselor uh, because people are not sure what to do. That may lead to helping an agency think about how they address and honor spirituality and spiritual supports. It may lead to your the chances for you as a chaplain or a pastor to do uh, staff in services about grief and loss. Uh, it may lead to helping agencies think through what a, a kind of cool idea I think is uh, not original with me is, but a loss assessment, which when somebody comes into a service agency and be, starts being supported, that as part of that entry process, if the support agency finds out about how that person, how that family has handled losses in the past, and what are the things that people would want most, depending upon their faith, their culture, their background, their experience, and also as a way of sharing with family and guardians, this is what we plan to do because there are going to be losses in this person's history in the future. Uh, there'll be losses in your family, and we want to tell you how we're handling this. And then there are these person-centered planning for end-of-life wishes, which we have mentioned in some of the other resources. And then simply going on from there, following the, following the rabbit down the rabbit hole. Where, where does the agency address and honor spirituality? What's been the spiritual journey of a family that you may have interacted with in, the, in a hospital? Are there doors to be opened, uh, clergy to be asked again, bridges to be built? Uh, ways to connect maybe community clergy with uh, disability ministry resources and other examples, uh, ways to connect agencies with the resources and, and other agencies who are doing a really good job about addressing people's spirituality uh, and faith issues. There's a lot of ambivalence sometimes because of past histories. Uh, ambivalence by families and agency staff or stories they've heard about people being rejected uh, or shut out of congregations or lacking the knowledge of positive roles or resources and really what I would call the blossoming of inclusive ministries and resources that's happening now and just simply not knowing how to ask or to knock on the door uh, just not certain how to do that remember that the world of faith and the world of human services are often two worlds of helping separated by a common language, English, that's used in very different ways. Um, uh, there's misunderstandings about whether religion and spirituality can be talked about at all in the world of human services, because some people think that's a, 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 uh, a not allowed under understandings of church-state separation, which is just not true, especially in an age of personal-centered planning that takes into account people's own wishes and their culture and their wants. Um, understandings of professional. Can a professional of various disciplines, can they include spirituality in their talking about resources and supports? And sometimes people get caught up between scientific perspectives on disability and religious perspectives. Uh, so one of the important things is clergy or chaplains, pastors, is when you're working with agencies who may be kind of unsure at first or hesitant, take walk in their shoes for a minute or roll in their shoes or roll in their wheelchair, so to speak. Um, Look from their side, just as the agencies out there are a complexity of names and 
alphabet soup and different uses of language. Think about them looking at the complexity of faith communities and the sheer number, and they don't know where to <clears throat> go for any kind of central connection. Think about their fears of proselytizing or maybe the stories that they've heard in the past. Think about the fact that they may not know if they can talk about spirituality and faith or how to talk about it, which is a place where you could provide some real resources and some gentle teaching and safe places to begin to talk about those issues and realize that spiritual life and supports are not usually included in evaluations and assessments and planning processes. But in the world, which kind of worships person-centered planning and person-centered services these days, uh, including the whole of somebody's life and their interests, there's a huge rationale for doing that. So key strategies for, for congregational leaders, clergy, chaplains, remember that professionals are also people. Uh, learn some of their language that they use in their respective profession and core mission statements. So how does faith-based supports or pastoral care or an inclusive ministry help that agency meet their mission, not just your mission, but their mission, usually around community inclusion and uh, having people have valued roles in community settings or help them to become more independent or build relationships? But how do they help address the people with disabilities and the families that you both support? You both are working, could, could be working with those people. A long time ago, a friend of mine talked about faith and human services working together. It was kind of like the phenomenon of para parallel play of two children in a sandbox playing with their own toys and building their own castles, but not playing with each other or interacting with each other in the same arena. So the real question is, how do you both walk along individual? alongside with individuals and their families. Again, some of those places we've mentioned for common ground are person-centered, family-centered supports and care, caring for caregivers, including respite care opportunities for families and for staff. Congregations, you are a generic and a natural support in the language of human services. And those are highly valued and talked about in the literature and policies, but not often tapped well in terms of people knowing what to do. As are our values of community inclusion and friendship, self-determination, giving, honoring people's choices and preferences, cultural sensitivity and competence, uh, to helping working with staff around very, especially very different understandings of faith and religious traditions. And that's even more important these days because of so many staff who work as caregivers and agencies come from many different cultures and are often immigrants or people who don't know kind of where their sense of community yet in this, in this, in where they are. And then finally, what's the kind of common sense of calling and vocation? between professionals who are working in the fields of human services and those in ministry. Think about what your congregation may already be doing uh, in the faith and within the, your faith community and within others. How are you accessible? What are you already doing around inclusive worship and inclusive religious education, in youth ministries, in family supports? in recreation and socialization, in opportunities for service to others, in outreach and community in ministry and social justice. Go back to Maggie, our slide earlier about lifespan. Think about what you think are the gifts and the strengths of your congregation right now. And be pretty certain that those gifts and strengths are things that people with disabilities and family members would love as well. Not necessarily a special ministry for special people, but just to be included in the same kinds of things that you offer to other people. There's some recent data uh, that says that uh, 
Americans without disabilities, about 57% of them go to a church or synagogue or a mosque at least once a month. And 50% of people with disabilities and their families do. There used to be a bigger gap there, but uh, there, there's just about just as many people coming uh, in the world of disability or wanting to come. In fact, many others wanting to come, but also wanting to have a sense that that they're welcome and included in the kinds of services and supports that are there. So let's think about some of those others from a lifespan perspective. Meg? Yep, uh, in addition to work in the congregation, there are lots of areas that we can help to be advocates for people with disabilities. Um, we mentioned working with agencies and advocacy groups on those spiritual supports. Uh, but also education and school and the transition for, for folks that are finishing their school time and going into the work world. Uh, community inclusion for adults is huge. Um, the, the landscape looks dramatically different than it did 10 years ago in terms of just the, the visibility of people with disabilities in our communities. Um, and also political advocacy. Um, I think that we tend to get uh, kind of weak in the knees about uh, mixing people of faith with political activism, um, but I think that there are ways to do that that are nonpartisan, um, that are important for us to, to look at. So starting at the beginning, uh, our first example of education. Um, very many families uh, with a child with an intellectual disability um, have been at this uh, since the age of early intervention, so maybe a year, two years old, um, toddler age. Um, and while that early intervention is going on, they might still be connected to a congregation. So is your church nursery equipped to handle a child with special needs? Uh, what about preschool programs? Can they include and support uh, this child whose needs are, are different from his or her classmates? Um, also, inclusive religious education. Um, it's good not only for the child with a disability, but it's good for the other kids that are in the classroom because they're all learning together about what it means to live in an inclusive environment. And it might take some real individual planning. Uh, I know that my personal congregation is sort of going through some growing, growing pains with this right now, trying to figure out how do we make uh, religious education accessible. Is it possible? Is it appropriate? Is it financially feasible to have a one-on-one -on -one educational assistant just like you know, my son would have in the school uh, that he attends Monday through Friday? Can we replicate that success on a Sunday morning? Um, so I think there's lots of options and the, the ability to be flexible and individual when we're looking at planning uh, I think is definitely an asset. Plus just the idea of peers, buddies, circles of supports. Um, when you go to coffee hour after the service, who do you hang out with? Who do you encounter at the grocery store? How, how do you create these relationships that are happening not just in school, but maybe also the congregation um, and in the community as well? One of the things that uh, happens for kids with uh, disabilities is an IEP as part of their education. Uh, it's an individualized educational plan um, that helps to make accommodations for what they need in order to level the playing field for them to be successful in school. Um, and it's a really stressful time. You create it every year. We're uh, sort of in the midst of IEP season right now, uh, planning for our kids for what they'll need beginning in the fall. Um, and trying to figure out what milestones are appropriate is really stressful. And what better way to support a family is to just ask. Say, hey, you know, would you like me to come along with you while you do this IEP? Do you want to talk about what is giving you stress? Do you want to talk about uh, what is exciting for you? Um, who are the people that are involved in this process? And how can we make this more of a collaboration and less like showing up in Pharaoh's court? Um, I think one of the things that is really interesting is that my belief that parents have the ability to help their children, uh, but sometimes we just need to be reminded that we have the ability to help our children. One of the best pieces of advice I ever got was, no one can do for your child what you can do for your child. Um, and that minister really helped me to remember that, you know, the people sitting across the table from me during IEPs are experts in their given field in speech, in uh, occupational therapy, in physical therapy. 
Uh, but as a parent, I'm an expert on my kid. Um, and so I think if we can help to be a voice of encouragement, a voice of empowerment, um, we can help to make that a, a more successful situation um, and to just be kept in the loop, you know, input on what's happening in the educational setting. Um, as pastoral care providers, that can really make a, a profound difference for people. Let me tell a story about this, and this is why it came first came to a number of years ago. I was at a uh, South Carolina at a Down Syndrome conference and spoke, and then afterwards said to the families, tell me your church stories, what's happened? And uh, one of the families got up and said, we took our minister with us to our IEP. It was wonderful. We got everything we wanted. They thought he was our lawyer. <laughs> and uh, it always gets a laugh, that story, from families, because uh, so many times IEPs have become adversarial situations between families and school systems. And just the simple power, I think, of a clergy person showing up with a family and saying, we care about what you all are doing here at the school. We want to know what we think is best because we want to see if we can also do some of that back in the congregational setting. But here's what we know from what's going on back there as well. And then simply being an ally along with the, the parent or two who's usually in there where there's a huge power imbalance between the families and the, the sort of array of professionals in front of you. So you don't have to be the lawyer, but the kind of gentle, powerful presence could make a huge uh, uh, difference for lots of families. Definitely. In terms of the teachers and the school team, um, I think that there can be sort of a, a hands-off sense, like what happens at school happens at school, what happens in the congregation happens in the congregation, and never the twain shall meet. Um, but Bill's absolutely right. One of the things that are helping a child be successful in their traditional classroom can be replicated in a congregation for religious education or, or any other purpose. Um, and I think there can be a reluctance to share information, but it, you know, let's, let's turn that on its ear. How about if we share information? How about if we um, use community resources to, to really keep not only the school and that school team, um, but also uh, the faith community in touch with one another? Um, helping people to become more empowered with better education uh, is something that, that can go easily uh, across those lines. Um, helping church volunteers learn, especially if they see a young person surrounded by a caring circle of adults and peers, um, and providing resources back and forth. Start the conversation, whether you're the chaplain, whether you're the parent, about what's working and what isn't, and, and building a sense of collaboration. Um, because it feels absolutely right. It can feel very adversarial, um, and really we have the same interests uh, at, at, in mind. Uh, and then looking to transition to the adult world uh, from entitle entitlement to uncertainty. Um, by law, children with disabilities uh, have to or are eligible to receive services up to the age of 21. Uh, and then what happens is they age out of the system. Uh, and so suddenly you've gone from this world where you're getting therapies and support and transportation to sometimes nothing. Um, and making that transition can be really, really stressful for families and for the individuals involved. So trying to navigate, what is God calling me to do? Where, where do I feel called? Is it education? Is it work? Is it a day program? And how can our faith communities help to discover that call and where they can live it out? So let me tell you about a project that I've been involved with. It has got it was around four states funded by a grant from the Kessler Foundation. We put together a project that, to, to pilot it based on the capacities of congregations to care about individuals, the capacity, the kind of magical capacity to, for people in a congregation to support current members, individually or particularly, the capacity to take on targeted initiatives that can help somebody, and their capacity often not thought of in this way the social capital that's available in any congregation, the amount of relation, the who knows who, the, the kinds of people with different skills and gifts who know other people with different skills and gifts. So how might we put those together, which has been the kind of premise of this project. 
and played intentionally on the faith and works paradigm uh, out of the biblical setting. And we know from our own religious traditions, whether, whatever tradition, that there's a huge spiritual and religious sense of the dignity of work and call. And I've been fascinated, for instance, for a long time by the idea from the New Test Old Testament image of the gleaners in the field, that the farmers of that day were not called to harvest all the crops and then give a tenth of them to those who were the widow or the orphan or those on the margins. They were called to leave a tenth of the field so people could guard, could glean them for themselves, could have the dignity of gathering their own food, of working for what they needed. And sort of a vision in my mind for a long time has been, you know, in a non-agrarian society, if we had every employer who was called themselves a person of faith to carve out a tenth, a fifth, a tenth or a twentieth of their business so that, and customize it so they make sure to employ people with disabilities, you wouldn't have the kind of huge unemployment numbers we have now in our country with people with disabilities, something approaching 75%. So in the model we've been working on, you think about a congregation, we've been helping a number of congregations in different states, helping the members to think about their connections to community groups, businesses, civic groups, nonprofits, other faith communities, colleges, friends, relatives, uh, other associations. And then by getting around an individual, working with an individual and their family, and, it, and hopefully this is a person that's grown up in your congregation. So it's not about starting an employment program. It's about getting Bill a job because we've known him. He's grown up. We see what he can do in our congregation. He's moving into an adult uh, role. How can we help him find a place to put his gifts and strengths into work in the community? So if you look at the congregation through a social networking eyes, what's the congregation full of? They are full of people who work in all different kinds of places, who have potentially all kinds of connections that if you knew somebody and knew their passions and what they were interested, these are people who could be tapped for advice and connections. And they may be professional groups, they may be other, all, any other kind of business. Or from another perspective, think about people's passions and their hobbies and their interests, how those might connect with the passions and interests of people with disabilities. It could be any kind of thing that where is that people are connected to in in other kinds of ways. And those are people who could often be asked and saying, so you know Bill, he's grown up in this congregation. We're a small group working with him. He really loves to garden and talk to the garden club member or maybe somebody who owns a gardening store or a place to see whether there's a place that somebody might be able to show their interest and their skills in that area, maybe as volunteer, but also as a potential job. So again, it's that kind of connections of interest with social capital and finding the opportunity. Most of us find our jobs through connections and who we know and people we know, uh, unless it's been, of course, when you apply to go to CPE programs, but even there you're getting and you're getting references from people and say, what's a good one? Where do, where should I go? You know me. What do you think? What would you recommend? And on the website, there's some resources, uh, a, a theological and theoretical paper about this, some ideas, but this summer there'll be a manual out uh, for congregations of all faith traditions to take and customize and use. Uh, so think about your congregation and helping people find valuable roles and that can start of course right within your congregation uh, asking people with disabilities what would you like to do here how would you like to help our wider congregation or faith community how would you like to help others and most people would jump at that chance uh, because they really would like to give as well as receive you build from there to think about community building Community building is based upon people's interests and gifts and on their capacities, not on their deficits. 
we don't build congregations based on everybody's needs and deficits. You build it off of people's strengths and their capacity and their call. You build it off of friendships and colleagues. And it's about relationships, relationships, relationships. It's not about a program per se. It's, it's relationships and building connections between people. If you know, you may know this, but in the world of disability services, there's a common exercise called a relationship map, where you think about an individual in the middle of a piece of paper, and their people around that person may be their family members, and you think about friends and close companions outside of that, you think about acquaintances, neighbors outside of that, then you think about people who are paid to be in their lives, doctors, programs they may go to, others. The real issue for most people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in particular is their relationship map has a few people around them in the middle. Families or close work are mostly family members and a number of people on the edge in the periphery, but not many relationships in between. Uh, people who know them, who are their friends, who are the places where they go to meet people, their barber, their pastor, their their club members or whatever. There's there's often a real vacuum there in terms of how do you build those kinds of connect and helping people build those kinds of connections. And the way to really think about that is what's the third thing that connects people? I spent years as a chaplain in this field trying to connect people with disabilities or anybody with a kind of other sense of a label on them with people in the community and build those relationships directly across the bottom. And there were so many problems in that. People's fear of disability, people's not knowing what to do, people's uncertainty, people getting into scared, all that kind of stuff. So finally, out of all the community building literature and learning and stuff I do, you realize that the really the closest and easiest ways to connect people is between something that connects them, a common passion, an interest. I like to go fishing. I like to opera. I like a particular sports club. I like to sing. I like to help others. I, uh, I like to what? Uh, go to a particular, so, and where are, who's involved in those third things? And what is that? And where do they happen? And when do those things happen? And how can we maybe get people connected to people who share capacity? And then you're asking people who are not disabled to respond out of their gifts and strengths to, and connect with somebody around who's got a similar passion or interest. So you're not asking them to respond out of what they don't know, but you're asking them to respond out of what they do know and a kind of sense of abundance about that. Um, one of my favorite stories is about that as a community connector in Australia who found a guy with severe cerebral palsy, terrible communication skills, and who couldn't talk well, and he went into his room, found out what his interests were. One of his major interests was because he had posters of motorcycles all over his wall, and he got this guy connected to, of course, the local biker club, uh, and who said the biker club thought it was a sense of heresy and a tragedy that uh, this guy who was passionate about motorcycles never had a chance to be around motorcycles. And by God, they could do something about that. So in a sense, what you're asking, I say sometimes tongue in cheek, is you're asking to change the tragedy. You know, it's not the disability. It's the fact that somebody with a passion or interest doesn't have the chance to be express that or be with other people around that thing and to connect people around that interest. There are also ways of building intentional circles of support around people with disabilities. Congregations have been doing that for centuries. They just not called it that where a group of people comes together around a family or somebody who has a particular need. Uh, and there's some models that are up called circles of support, group action planning, and just a number of ways of looking at that that are easy to find out. The Mennonites have a wonderful little booklet called Supportive Care in the Congregation, which is around creating circles of support in a congregational setting. But the key is, I think the key spirit of that is to be surrounded by people who are not sitting there being sorry for your disability, but being, but people who are 
what see your gifts and strengths and want to support you to have a life that's included and help you do the kinds of things that you need to do. Can we also recognize that disability rights are another form of civil rights? The churches have not been involved in the disability rights movement nearly as much as they were in civil rights. And as you reach out to disability networks in your area, start a conversation with them through a Center for Independent Living, through state DD councils, through university centers, through the American Association of People with Disabilities. But the people with disabilities and their families in your congregation are going to tell you what the policy issues are and what the current issues are in that state, in that community, in the country. And moving beyond these polarities, we're all kind of on the spectrum between disabled and able. Uh, we are, there's, we all can be included. We're not, people are not victims, nor are they heroes. Work on a language that's beyond us and them, uh, a language that recognizes that we all have limits and that we all have gifts. And one of the things, I want to, it kicks right into the question of hospitality, both in our congregations and in our organizations. <clears throat> and there's a wonderful little CD called Our, Book, Our Door is Open, Creating Welcoming Cultures and Helping Organizations. From this guy Bruce Anderson at the Community Activators Net. He's at communityactivators.org. And it's a really helpful piece, not just about disability, but helping any agency, hospital chaplaincy office, uh, emergency room, congregation, think up through about whether or not they really are welcoming in the ways that they would like to be welcomed. <coughs> and I want to just move in to say, well, we move back for a second. You maybe have heard Parker Palmer talk about this, but he says, of course, that in our spiritual understandings of hospitality, the, the gift really is not the host to the stranger, but what the stranger brings to the host. Um, and Parker takes that and reverses it a bit and says, in our time, so what a stranger does is it help the world to be a safer place for all of us because if the world's not safe for strangers, it's not safe for me because I'm a stranger to multiple other people. Um, it, uh, hospitality saves us from the boredom of sameness. If we think we're all alike or we say, oh, they're different. We're all alike here. We're not like them. One, it may be just really boring to be all the same. And two, if a congregation says that, that's really an illusion because the congregation might have had a knockdown, drag out fight about something the night before, and people have very different opinions or feelings about something. And think about the, the value of diversity in your own lives. And I think about Philadelphia, for instance, where Maggie is, and the huge diversity of ethnic foods compared to Waco, where I am. And that's one of the things I miss most about Jersey after our move. And then Parker says that diversity, of course, helps us to learn about ourselves and the hidden wholeness, that at the heart of creation are very diverse viewpoints that all point to the common truth in different ways and help us see different parts of what it means, of what truth means in relationship to that. You may know Henry Nouwen's wonderful statement about the paradox of ministry is that we really... Uh, our ministry really needs to be one of active receiving, of helping people find their gifts and are receiving those gifts, not so much our offering the gifts to other, our gifts to other people, but figuring out ways that people who often feel like they don't have gifts to respond to others. And that's true for congregations and congregational members and agencies and all the people and families that we support. And the numbers are huge. There are 350,000 plus congregations in this country. So it's a natural and generic support for people. We're the largest organization in the country that has capacities to act in something. So one of the last things that we'd like to touch on, we've got just a couple minutes left, uh, is advocacy in policymaking. Um, I think the idea of lobbying the government for anything can feel very intimidating for a lot of people. 
Uh, but our involvement in inclusive community can also mean encouraging legislation and speaking out against policies that don't work. Sometimes we reform from the inside and sometimes we tear down the structure to make something that's more equitable um, for our inclusive community. And I think that this doesn't have to be a political thing. Um, I think that uh, encouraging uh, a sense of rules, a sense of legislation that includes all members fairly and values their diversity is really a nonpartisan issue. So whether you are uh, conservative, progressive, moderate, uh, all of the above, none of the above, uh, I think it's important to be mindful of new laws that are in your area and how they will affect people with disabilities. Uh, Bill was absolutely right. He said, talk to the people in your community um, for the, that are, are dealing with disability. They will tell you what is out there. What, what are the hot button issues? And listen to the concerns of those families. Encourage them to tell you their stories. Uh, and then once you've heard those stories, once you have engaged in that moment of pastoral care, uh, one of my favorite quotes uh, that I've got on my bulletin board right over here is, it is not enough to be compassionate, you must act. Um, I think that the world is run by people who show up, uh, and when people of faith, people that are chaplains, ministers, pastors, are the ones that show up, uh, we bring um, a, a different voice to the table. Uh, so I encourage you to reach out to your elected officials and to talk to them about the kinds of things that are weighing on your heart. Um, there's an element for, for us about speaking truth to power in all of this, to, uh, to be a prophetic voice um, in what can be a very unjust system. Um, and I think that we really have a role to play. Um, one of the things, uh, Bill, if you want to click onto the next screen, um, that's going on right now uh, is called Avante's Law. Um, it is named for Avanti Oquendo. Some of you may remember this was in the news a couple of years ago. A young man, 14 years old from Queens, um, mostly nonverbal on the autism spectrum. Uh, and like so many people on the autism spectrum, uh, he had uh, a habit of eloping from safe places. Um, it's very common for people uh, with ASD um, to uh, see something, not experience a sense of danger, and want to go follow it. And so they will just elope from their safe space. Um, he was missing for many months, uh, and his remains were finally found in the East River uh, in January of 2014. Um, it really, I think, rocked the whole uh, autism community. It rocked uh, certainly our family uh, because we can see commonalities in, in our kids uh, in what happened to this young man. Um, so the legislation uh, that is before Congress right now, Avante's Law, um, it is really getting good support from both sides of the aisle. Um, Bill, if you want to click onto the next screen, there you go. Uh, training for first responders is one of the big things that it tackles, uh, and that's not something that's progressive or conservative. It's something that just helps people. Um, uh, it is making its way through Congress, and it would help to safeguard individuals with autism who are prone to wandering, um, people like Avante was, people like my own son, um, and to mobilize first responders in different ways with more effective tools for finding people with cognitive disabilities. Because if you have a child that goes missing from their school, like Avante did, and you send out a, a team of searchers with dogs that are barking, with loud whistles, with flashlights calling out their name, how does a nonverbal kid with sensory overload issues going to respond from that? Run away? not be able to shout out, I'm here, over here. So I think the way that we approach that has to be fundamentally different. Um, and so legislation like this uh, is hoping to address uh, sort of the, the chasm um, in between the old way of doing things and what needs to be done uh, in order to address that. Um, another thing that is really a hot button issue right now um, is the proposed FDA a rule to ban the use of electrical shock as behavioral control. Um, there uh, have been sort of the old mentality of using electroshock therapy uh, either for treatment in some cases uh, for conditions like depression, um, but also uh, think of like using a, a taser um, uh, on a young uh, individual with a developmental disability uh, because of their, their acting out, because of their behaviors. So there's a long campaign going on to stop the use of this electrical shock uh, as an aversive conditioning tool. 
Uh, it's going on in Massachusetts, um, and uh, Bill has put the link up there as well. Um, so these are issues where we can advocate for the people that we care about, that we can be a voice for people in our community um, and, and be in touch with the people that, that make the rules um, to help start a conversation about uh, how do we change the system to make it more equitable, more just, uh, more user-friendly, more safe for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, and our voices are really important. So I want to encourage you to not just speak out on those two issues, although those are two that are important and, and ongoing right now, but to really use your voice to, to not just be compassionate, but to act. And to expand on the first responders for just a minute, there is a, uh, there's a foundation uh, in, um, in Boston, the Ruderman, the Ruderman Family Foundation that's Jewish in background is doing a lot of good work around disability and disability inclusion. But they also put out a report recently with something over 50% of the cases in which we've heard a lot about in the last couple of years of people being uh, killed or mishandled by police. Uh, something over 50% of those folks are people with some form of disability who might not, you know, there might, might not have known uh, the best way to respond or just there, there were, these were factors that, that are, they acted strange and these were factors that sent, you know, got the anxiety or the fear up by the, by the police. But a, there's an amazing percentage of those, those cases where that's happened. Um, and if you don't know uh, this electrical shock issue, it's not about uh, ECTs or right? it's about using like, uh, uh, Maggie like said, tasers and other forms of electrical shock is an aversive conditioning. Like, don't do that. If you do it again, we're going to shock you. Uh, and that would be surprising to many people that that's still done here. But if you just Google the Judge Rottenberg Center, you, in fact, would find some videos of that that's going on. This has been a hard campaign just to say there are many, many more people. And this has particularly been people who are, with ver who are very severe on the autism spectrum. Many, many more people around the country who are being with very disturbing behavioral issues that are being supported and treated in ways that have nothing to do with the kind of aversive conditioning, but really finding out what that behavior is about and looking at ways to help them learn more positive kinds of behavior. If you're looking for resources, these are just a few more of the ones that you could take places to go for. There's a Resource listing for the series. It's on the ACP website. The Quality Mall is a, res is a place that's got lots of resources around intellectual and developmental disabilities, including spirituality, grief and loss issues. Our Collaborative on Faith and Disability is, be will, is beginning to collect a number of papers, research data, other resources and things related to faith communities and disabilities. And if you want to get information about new things that are happening on a regular basis look up the institute on theology and disability on facebook and just sign up uh, if we use it for new resources and or maybe policy issues like some of these ones just here that faith communities could do something about so with that we're going to see there is a question i think mm -hmm. and Um, it looks like someone has asked, um, how do you encourage people who are reluctant through either bad experiences or lack of exposure to become involved in a faith community? Wow, that's um, a really good question and a really big question. Um, I think that uh, we're just, uh, we're at a very interesting point because we're starting to come to terms uh, in the larger faith community uh, about how we engage people with various kinds of disability. And I think that um, previous generations have had a lot of really difficult experiences. Um, our own family left a denomination because they were uh, unable and unwilling to meet the needs of our family. Um, and from what I've read in, in the literature, uh, that's a pretty common experience. Um, so I think that for families uh, who are touched by disability, there's both a yearning to become involved. Um, I think that people are uh, at their best when we're in healthy relationship with one another. 
Um, but there's this wariness too, uh, remembering the ways that they've been burned in the past. Um, so I think hospitality is a good way to start. Um, a radical inclusivity, radical acceptance um, are, are things in our own faith journey that have been very important. Um, the congregation that we're currently members of uh, I had gone for a couple of months just by myself, and then when it seemed safe enough, we started to bring the kids along. Um, and I remember very clearly one Sunday, uh, the service was stretching a little bit longer, and uh, the kids were starting to get a little antsy. Uh, and my son, uh, this was probably a couple of years ago, uh, started making some vocalizations. Um, some squeaking, some hand flapping, things that for an autism family were very much part of our experience. Um, but I thought, oh gosh, he's making these noises in the midst of this new congregation. I got to get him out of here. Um, and so quickly picked up our bags and our crayons and things and, and ushered him out into the, the main lobby area. Uh, and one of the matriarchs of the church flew out after us uh, and uh, was absolutely horrified. She said, why are you leaving? And I said, well, the kids are starting to get kind of noisy, you know, so I thought I'd take them out here. And she was, was shocked. She said, but they're children. They make noise, disability or not. And I felt so relieved at her sense of radical hospitality. I literally wept on her shoulder. So I think there's a lot that we can do to break down barriers one person at a time. Uh, and I think a sense of really radical uh, acceptance and hospitality can really go a long way. And two quick comments about that, and we'll go to the second question. If bad experiences is giving people time to tell the story and listen to it, and don't try to explain it away. You know, hear the pain and accept the pain. Embrace that pain. Uh, then people will begin to trust you again and then begin to ask, what can we do here so we make sure that doesn't happen? Uh, and, and so you demonstrate by your action, you're listening first, and then your action on that. Lack of exposure. Invite them to come over someday, not on Sunday or Saturday. Walk them through the church. Say, teach people kind of what's going on, how what people do there, what uh, what's the hidden curriculum in a church, so to speak. Uh, here are the here are kind of what our expectations are. This is what our service is like. You could think about that being an adult home, adult group home and having a group of people come and come on a, during the week and then have them learn by where's the bathroom. This is. Walk through a service with them so you get people prepared in ways that you and I take for granted. Or if you just go back and remember the first time you were in a faith community, it was very different than your own, what kind of guidance you wished you had had uh, for that. Um, the second question was, how much can you do within a chaplaincy setting about some of these suggestions in this talk uh, with their family or through social work existence? Uh, uh, think about if you th if you think about uh, Christine Pulchowski's FICA spiritual assessment. The last the last A on that after you found out something about their spirituality or their journey is the question: How can we assist you with this? Is there any way we could help with support in relation to that? And that might be lead to uh, your helping them find a congregation that might be welcoming and willing to include uh, to, to meet this this family or it might even be uh, say could would you be would you like us to talk with your pastor uh, and that puts you in a that kind of anxious role of perhaps being a uh, an advocate but also the issues they might have had with a pastor or a rabbi or somebody might have been one several times ago and uh, you know to help begin to start a conversation. Um, so helping to find places, resources, letting them know the kind of positive things that are happening because people have no vision of that now, uh, as much vision of that, that there are lots of good models out there for, for people and for congregations around that. So uh, telling the good stories, helping people get a vision about what can happen, that it is happening in other places. Sometimes I call that friendly competition that you begin to say to somebody, well, if they can't do it, if they can do it over at First Baptist, how can't we can't do it at First Methodist? You know, it's uh, uh, in the human services world, we call it best practices and trying to live up to kind of best practices and, um, you know, with, with the right kind of support and the willingness to ask the questions and kind of go step by step. That's the way you get there. 
Are there okay. other questions? I believe our time has come to an end. So thank you to Bill and to Maggie for today's presentation and to everybody for joining us today. The recording of the webinar as well as a copy of the presentation will be found on the ACP Academy webpage located under the resources section of the ACPE website. Thanks for joining us. Have a wonderful day.